Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining on another episode of Dress and Drinks. I'm Leon Lieber, the host, and I'm a uh, professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University. Really excited to share today's episode with you all. So I'm really excited today to bring to you a wonderful colleague and author, Karen Fetter. In addition to contributing to the exhibition Barbie, a cultural icon exhibition, 65 years of fashion and inspiration, which will soon travel to the Phoenix Art Museum in 24, uh, Karen recently wrote Barbie Takes the Catwalk, a style icon's history in fashion. She was the former costume consultant for the Liberace Foundation and Museum, the Mob Museum, and David Copperfield's International Museum and Library of the Conjuring Arts. Um, and, and she currently works in film, entertainment, exhibitions, and has great experience in entertainment, fashion, attraction, marketing, and the museum industries. Barbie Takes the Catwalk was Fetter's pandemic project and delves into the Mattel doll's relationship with fashion, particularly the unique expertise of behind-the-scenes artisans responsible for creating the doll's miniature fashion. So we will look at some of that today. Um, so we're very excited to invite Karen to us. So Karen, come on and join us and let's get this party going. And by the way, today's cocktail is the Cosmopolitan and classic favorite. I've got mine. Cheers. The gorgeous one. Um, awesome. Thank you. Karen, it Thank is you, so Dad. great to see you. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to the Costume Society of America for this opportunity to talk to everyone today. I have been a member of this organization for almost 20 years now, and I, I'm quite proud of my membership and my uh, participation with the Costume Society of America. So um, I encourage anyone who's thinking about becoming a member and joining our gang of, of uh, people that love fashion and dress to do so. So Fantastic. today- Fantastic, thank you. You're, That's you're awesome. Welcome. And while we're on celebrating CSA, this is our 50th anniversary. And so please consider giving large amounts of cash to Costume Society to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Um, a, you, We will accept checks or cash. I mean, you could just send a bag of cash and we would take really? it. Um, um, Karen, like, let's start on this. This is great. And it's such great timing given the Barbie movie and all of that, uh, which is amazing. I forgot to wear pink today. I'm totally sorry. It was like, oh my gosh, as I got to work, it was like, oh, yeah, wear pink. Um, yeah, so, so today, so this presentation is going to focus on the um, Barbie, a cultural icon exhibition and the resulting book. Um, and this, a, a, as you mentioned, Leon, this, this, the, 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 the birth of, of this project was um, due to my extra time um, during the pandemic. So, yes. So before I landed in Barbie land, I was working in the costume and textile collection at the Nevada State Museum. And my mission at that institution was to develop the costume and textile collection so that it better represented Las Vegas and the height of the entertainment capital of the world. And um, mid-century through the 80s, what was happening in Vegas mostly was the cabaret scene. And so I spent a lot of time trying to rescue costumes from those old shows and bring them into the collection to add and better represent um, Las Vegas. As an example of the sort of costumes from this cabaret genre, this is from a show called Hallelujah Hollywood. This is the showboat costume that we saw in the finale of Hallelujah Hollywood. Hallelujah Hollywood opened in Vegas in 1974 and ran until 1980. And the, the costumes were designed by Bob Mackey and, and his partner Ray Aguillon. And the this showboat costume is one of about eight that we saw in the finale that all represented various um, hits that Ziegfeld had um, on Broadway. So this, of course, represents showboat, the Ziegfeld um, hit showboat. And 
this um, costume, when I, when I first landed at the museum, the costume was scattered all around collection storage in about eight different pieces. And so after we put it together, um, I, I happened to find a woman and showgirl who wore this costume during the 70s. And she came in to tell me about um, her experience wearing this. And one of the, the most charming aspects was that she talks about how when it came time to get into the costume, she would stand either stage left or right and stand there with her arms in the air and the costume that was stored in the rafters would just be lowered right onto her. And the way that the costume is worn, it's simply like a pair of overalls. There are shoulder straps and that's it. And um, there is no brassiere. I think it's a, it's a topless costume, but I, there's a picture that I have of this costume on stage and the performer is wearing a brassiere with it. But I think that was a promotional photograph. And a lot of times the showgirls didn't want to be nude with these promotional photographs. So I get the feeling that was not, the brassiere is not part of this costume. This in fact is a topless, showgirl costume and it's huge we had to build um a special little cart this costume has its own cart and you know when we show researchers we roll out the cart and show the showboat costume but it's like the showboat part you know is a good four and a half feet and you see how far it extends above the head it's it's really a fantastic thing that's amazing okay things that very few people know. I used to work at Beach Blanket Babylon in San Francisco. So I'm with you on this, on this showboat costume. Oh my God, I love the, the paddle wheel at the back. That's amazing. So How this, much does this costume weigh, literally? Um, I, it's super, it's actually really heavy. There's, it's mostly wire. There's no like, you know, you know, the, the newfangled stuff. This was 74, this was built. So the frame yep. is all wire and, um, you see that, you see where the little arrow is pointed? That's a hand crank. And in fact, it's connected <laughs> to the paddle wheel. And the concept was the showgirl was supposed to hand crank that and the paddle wheel would move and they don't look like the ruffles are positioned in such a way that it looks like water flowing from the paddle wheels. But though, so, so Jackie, who came in to talk to me about wearing this costume, she said, I remember when we first got these costumes and when we were rehearsing with them and we were told that I was supposed to do the cranking as I walked across stage. She said, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it because to keep the costume on, I had to hold on to the smokestacks. So she said, I didn't have a third hand to do the cranking. So the cranking never really happened. But I, I love this concept because it really just, you know, exemplifies the wit of Bob Mackey's design work. I mean, this was like an extra little thing that probably only the first row ever saw, but it was just entertaining to Bob and the, to maybe a handful of performers. But it's one of the really special ones. And as far as I know, this is the only surviving costume from that um, series of eight in the uh, finale. And you can understand why, where were these things? This one came to the museum because someone had rescued it and it had been living in his garage for like a decade or two. And, and they're just too big. And that's why these things don't, don't, you know, live to tell the story because who can afford to take care of them? But we do have this yeah. one and it's really a priceless piece. It's really fantastic. Especially if you think about seeing this from stage and has such a great presentational quality, but close up it gets a little kind of something yeah, something. And yeah, so it it's scary. like yeah, in person it's yeah. scary because it's it's well over time it's lost all of its guts, so there's no padding. You just see the scary frame, you know, the metal frame inside. It looks like it would be yeah. torturous to wear. Um, but so this is another example of um, what we collected at the State Museum. This particular costume is designed by Pete Menifee for a show called Jubilee, um, which ran at, in Vegas on the strip from 1981, like, finally close 35 years later. And it's considered one of the more expensive cabaret shows ever built in history. Um, and P. Benefee and Bob Mackey designed this. And the sketches that you see here that relate to the costume are Pete's original sketches. And the museum acquired almost 200 of Pete's sketches for the collection. And they're these beautiful 
wonderful large scale works of art um, of his costumes for this show. There are hundreds and hundreds of costumes. Um, wow. This is a costume that you see here that in fact is not part of our the State Museum's collection. It still is owned by Caesars, who owned Jubilee. And now this costume is getting a second life um, on stage. The performer, performer Dita Von Teese recently opened up her burlesque show here in Vegas, and she has incorporated a handful, a good handful of the Jubilee costumes into her show. So I haven't oh, seen fantastic. that show yet, but the costumes were made to such a level of quality and and um and you know a long lasting quality that they're still viable today understanding that this is a piece that was made in the you know 1980s so it was made in the late 70s um and so those costumes some of them are still you can still see them on stage in dita's show so i'm excited to see how that is all pulled together but um again the scale of this costume um you understand what you know our storage looks like at, at, at the state museum and um it is you know it's really fun to 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 work with these these pieces they're little miniature works of art there's so much sculptural quality to them even without a body in them it's really fascinating a question about this one karen yes. sure, i have two things one yes um so i love this this is a great showgirl costume it's really amazing um, for for our audience members who may or may not be familiar with these sorts of things, how do the wrist loops and that little bicep loop stay on their body without moving around? Because it looks like this magical piece of jewelry that just drapes off of their arm. Yes. Um, well, it is magical, of course. But the magic is assisted with a few um, elastic straps that are painted to match the exact color of the entertainer's skin. So from the audience, you really don't see any of that business. And the, the rhinestones really just catch the eye and you wouldn't even notice, even if the color was off a little from the skin tone in terms of the elastic. You're really looking at the shine and the way that the lights are catching the rhinestones. Um, an interesting thing about this costume, unbelievably, the little, the feather bustle spray, that's not achieved with a backpack, which a lot of, a lot of times these big feather arrays behind the body are put on with strap, shoulder straps, as we call that a backpack. This, in fact, is all attached to the G-string, and unbelievably, the G-string holds up all of that business behind her, that little feather yeah. bustle business. And so you can imagine how entertaining it is as she is moving across the stage, right? And how this feather, the feathers are reacting to her movement in the air. And it's just, a, you know, a continual, the feathers are in a sort of continual flight on the stage. And that's, you know, one of the, the brilliant things about these cabaret costumes is that they have a kind of life of their own. Yeah. And also that's part of the reason they're often feathers is because Feathers are light as air. They're, they, I mean, in, they don't take up that much weight, but they take up a lot of space and they're very active things. So it's really excellent. Um, yeah. And by the way, Karen, if you want to go say, see Dita Von Teese's show, let me know. I'll come to Vegas. We can go together. Good. Okay. Excellent. So one of the big acquisitions for <laughs> the Nevada State Museum at Las Vegas was the, all the surviving costumes for the Foley Berger production. And the Foley Berger show ran at the Tropicana Hotel from 1959 till it finally closed nearly you know, 50 years later. And we, um, we accessioned 8,000 pieces from that were just being stored backstage at the Tropicana. And so the bulk of the cabaret costumes at the State Museum right now are from the Foley Berger. And what is really fascinating about this collection is because it's such a broad period of time that we really see an evolution of stage costume in Vegas and in the cabaret genre from the late 50s through the 2000s. And in the middle there, we develop Lycra, right? 
So there's like a before Lycra period and an after Lycra period, and the costumes take on an entirely different kind of vibe before and after. And that's a fascinating thing to study. Yeah, BL and AL. Yeah, right. <laughs> So this is one piece um, from, uh, one costume from 1980. And this was designed by Nolan Miller for the Folie Bergère. And oh my, I've Nolan not heard that name in so long. That is incredible. So the, a lot of people, and I didn't know this either, that Nolan Miller was doing cabaret work at the same time that he was doing the Charlie's Angels and Dynasty, all of his, you know, Emmy award winning television work. So he was also really skilled in this genre. And this is a costume, you know, from a Marie Antoinette Versailles scene. And um, we, this, these, all these pieces survive in, in the collection. And you can see, you know, you barely see um, Debbie's um, name tag. Uh, it says Nolan Miller for Debbie, and the performer you see pictured there, her name is, her first name is Debbie, so that's Debbie's costume. And, of course, this poof headdress um, from, you know, the late 1700s is over four feet tall, and it has, you know, a typical kind of skull cap structure, and you would think it would be impossible to balance, but there is an expertise to designing these amazing headdresses. So yeah. in fact, as long as the showgirl knows how to do it, you can really keep it straight up in the air. Next well, slide. and actually what also makes these so interesting, so um, is like these kinds of headdresses, um, you know, a lot of people think that that's just like a ton of wig underneath that. And there's really a bit in, an internal structure, like a cage essentially, so that there's very little hair on top of all of that. So it also keeps it light and for the performer, so it doesn't hurt their neck. Uh, so that way then you add more stuff on top of it. So it's a really interesting way of creating that illusion. Yeah, and again, this is, so this, this was in the 1980 edition of the Fully Bergere, and the show had new editions every other year um, for like until 1975, and then after 75 had new editions every handful of years. So this was the 1980 edition, and still we're not looking at any newfangled kind of materials to create a lightweight structure underneath. It's still a wire structure that's then decorated with all, all of this stuff. So it's not, it's not lightweight, but it is well balanced. Yeah. So this is the skirt <laughs> that, goes, that goes with the bodice and the headdress. And what's fascinating about the, the state of survival is, of this skirt is that you see where the red circle is at the bottom of that bottom picture. You'll see that there is an applique missing. And that applique was removed by the wardrobe department and added onto the new skirt you see at upper right. So <laughs> this, so this costume has had at least two lives. And in and there were there's a lot of this kind of um, recycling that goes on oh, yeah. with these shows because the the most viable components of these cabaret costumes are the the decorative embellishments, right? Those appliques that are made with stones and 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 heavy embroidery thread. Those easily can then be cut off. And they, they still look great, as you see on this brand new skirt. Um, and so it gives life to an entirely new costume at a minimal expense, because the most expensive part of really all these costumes are the, the glass, the stones, and the decorative handwork that was required to embellish all of them. So this skirt is a good six feet wide. And the designer, um, the, the, uh, the artistic director at the time, Jerry Jackson, Tell, tell, tells the story about how with these costumes, there were a series of these huge um, pannier skirts on stage at once. And he talks about how um, the real show for this scene was backstage because the logistics of getting all of these women on and off stage without running into each other with these huge skirts was just entirely entertaining and priceless. <laughs> 
that's amazing. And look how enormous those that motif is that you're talking about. That applique piece is like three feet tall. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah, amazing. It's, uh, this is it's all, I mean, it's all lame. It's a lame fabric. And then on top of that is this embroidered lame with the rhinestones and the glass. And they're, you know, it's all wind set and it's incredibly heavy. And, but fantastic, right? It's fantastic. Okay, so the women in the background of this, are they actually topless or so, is that or is, is that a stage thing? So this is, yeah, so this is one of those photographs, like I explained in the beginning, where this was a photograph taken for publicity, where the Las Vegas New News Bureau came in to take pictures to publicize the show to the rest of the world. And the performers knew this, and they weren't willing to go topless. So they're wearing their own personal bras in the back. So in fact, those are topless costumes. Fantastic. So this is the book, my last book that resulted after we acquired the Fully Bergerer collection. Um, I had never seen the show in Las Vegas. And so I spent um, a number of years researching the show, talking to all sorts of entertainers who worked on stage, behind the scenes. And this show just, I mean, this book sort of documents all of my research so that going forward, the folks at the State Museum have a place to start and can continue on because the collection is so vast that there's tons more work and interesting stories to be um, found there in this Foley Berger archive. So well, you also get to see the Jeannie gets her costume inspiration from. Um, so then COVID, so now, now, now the state museum, I'm working at the state museum, COVID happens. This is how Las Vegas deals with COVID. We put showgirls out there and, um, this is, she's the showgirl on the left is actually wearing a sort of hybrid of a Jubilee costume. Um, and the wardrobe department there made her a matching mask. So we still had showgirls walking, masked showgirls walking around and you see Caesar as on his own specialty lame um mask and um this was the transition that that um gave me time away from my institution to develop um my next project so at the state museum i was working with a man named david porcello and david was um david is a fantastic collector of many different um, he has a vintage fashion collection, and we acquired a number of pieces from his vintage fashion collection into the State Museum's archive. Um, but one thing we weren't really able to incorporate because it doesn't necessarily fit the mission, but I loved was his intense Barbie collection. And David has been collecting Barbies um, since he was eight years old. And he, at one point in time, decided that he created a mission for his Barbie collecting. And he wanted to collect every single outfit made for Barbie doll between 1959, when she was invented, 1959, through 1999. And he, at one point, got so close to collecting everything, he decided, well, maybe now I should collect, because he was collecting uh, fashion that had been played with. In other words, fashion that had been taken out of the packaging. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just add on, now I'll start collecting everything in the package so we can see a before and after how it was packaged. Because a lot of times it's really entertaining to see how these things were packaged and the evolution of that, of that packaging. So, so David's collection was always in the back of my mind. And I wondered if now that I had time, if I could figure out um, some way that we could develop this into a interesting project. And this picture um, shows, I think he was sorting by era here. So this looks like a 70s and or 80s pile of David's Barbie dolls. So um, here's David with one of his um, dolls. And um, included in his collection are things other than fashion. Just along the way, he just started accumulating things like carry cases, vinyl carry cases, various Barbie vehicles, 
bar, other Barbie ephemera. I mean, all sorts of things. Things people just started giving stuff to David Tillett's so collection. The footprint kept growing and growing and growing. All sorts of branded merchandise. And so, so what we came up with as a concept, and we thought, well, okay, if we develop a, a concept, um, because David and I were both so entrenched in vintage fashion, we thought, well, let's, isn't it interesting maybe to juxtapose Barbie fashion with what was actually going on at the time in the culture that Barbie fashion was released? Why did the Barbie fashion designers come up with these looks for Barbie? Are in fact they directly related to cultural moments in time, moments on the catwalk, moments seen in Vogue magazines, moments seen by musical artists of the time? And so that, that was the direction we were taking is let's make this just a fashion exhibition. Um, let's not talk, this is not, this is not a discussion about the Barbie form. We weren't interested in talking about Barbie's skin color, the shape of her body. We just wanted to talk about what she wore. And so that, that was the direction um, that we took. And this, what you're looking at in this slide is a, um, uh, this is a Lily Rubin life size. And I think it's inspired by Terry Mugler of the time. And then you see Barbie's look which is awfully related. Um, and the other thing that's even, even more synergistic is the fact that with this outfit comes the dog. And at this moment in time, Terry Mugler was always sending dogs down the runway um, with his fashion. And so it wouldn't surprise me that this is where this inspiration comes from, which is, you know, absolutely charming and wonderful. Next slide, please. I mean, the moment this slide came up, I was like, Jerry Mugler, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Very close. So we, so David and I reached out to um, a local um, company, Illusion Projects. Illusion Projects um, has been in the business here in Vegas making, they started out making, um, designing really huge scale, magic props, those kind of props you see that take the whole stage, like when a helicopter disappears from stage, Illusion Projects makes, you know, creates and develops and builds those kind of things. And wow. um, they, um, and, I, and I knew that, that Tim was interested in um, getting into the um, exhibition business. And so we, we reached out to them and um, said, this is, this is our concept. We have the collection, we have all of the archival objects, um, and would you be interested in partnering? And so Illusion was interested, and then, and then Illusion decided to reach out to Mattel to see if they could get a license to make this an authorized um, exhibition. Um, and Mattel was interested, and so this became a partnership between the, the three entities, um, the uh, David's collection, um, my company, Illusion Mattel. So um, we developed this exhibition for a year and a half and 200 dressed Barbie dolls later, uh, we opened the exhibit in Las Vegas at the tail end of um, the epidemic, uh, pandemic, and we were still, you know, all wearing masks really. Um, but the interesting thing is we secured a place in a location here on the Strip, um, and it's a, it's a shopping mall. It's called the Shops at Crystals, and it's a very high-end shopping mall. Louis Vuitton has a store, Gucci has a store, um, and there was a um, storefront. Gucci had a storefront. They were moving out of their storefront into a bigger storefront, so there was this vacant storefront. And we put our exhibition in that storefront. And it worked out really great. It was a big enough footprint and there was a lot of foot traffic that wouldn't necessarily make a special trip to see a Barbie exhibition, but just happened to be walking past in the shopping mall and ended up coming into the Barbie exhibition. Um, so it was an unusual space for a fashion exhibition, but it really worked out great. And we lived there for over a year. Wow. 
And so this is um, what is called the number one Barbie doll. And this is the very first edition of the very first Barbie doll. And this, in fact, this doll is not owned by, by David. This doll is owned by Mattel. And this comes from their archive. And it is a very special, expensive, and elusive doll. And we, for the exhibition, had to borrow this from Mattel. And this doll came with a bunch of restrictions. And one of the yeah. restrictions is that if this doll travels, when we travel it from uh, location to location, for in the tour, the doll has its own suitcase, special suitcase, and the doll has to travel with a person attached to the suitcase. You can't put the doll on a truck without a person. You can't put the doll in a plane if you're not holding on to the suitcase. I mean, it's not one of those suitcases where there's like, you know. <laughs> Tell me you have a, please tell me you have a handcuff as well. That would it's be not that bad. What's it's in your bag? <laughs> it's not that bad, but just about. But it is a very special doll. And, you know, we David doesn't own one of these just because they are so elusive and they're super expensive. Every once in a while, you'll see one come up for auction and they're in the tens of thousands of dollars. And what's interesting about this doll is that there are like a handful of dolls that to our eye, non-expert eyes, they all look like the same doll. But in fact, they're a little bit different. The plastic formulations are a little bit different. Um, and in this case, this doll's skin look, has kind of like a green tinge to it. And that helps you date it. Um, that was one of the very first formulations. And over time, through oxidation, this is the, the, the doll has taken on this sort of weirdly ghostly greeny color and, and that helps authenticate it in fact. The other the other hey, piece I, is a quality to her. Like yeah. in this picture it has, it has that very porcelain doll quality. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's the plastic. It's not like, you know, and as the plastic formulations changed they got more rubbery because that was necessary when the arms started to bend and stuff here there's no bending the arms are only you know they hinge from the shoulders and the legs hinge from the hips i mean there's no yeah. you know so there's it's just it is a very hard plastic the other unique thing about this number one is that the original plan that mattel had to make the doll stand in this doll's feet, there are copper tubes, and there was, and it was, and that, and then there was a stand that came with this doll that had little posts, and you would stick the posts up into the tubes, and that's how the doll stood. That only lasted, like I think, this one single edition. Um, it didn't work for various reasons, and um, so those dolls that have those tubes in the feet through the legs, there, that's one way that you can tell it's the very first addition of this wow. doll. Um, another fascinating requirement from Mattel, um, you know, because we were working with them on this project, is that before Mattel allowed our exhibit to open to the public, they sent one of their own personal professional stylists um, to come and make sure every doll's hair was styled um, to fit um, their needs. And um, this, these, these people came with little toothbrushes and special solutions and, and um, literally you won't see. The real uh, water, curling I know. And, a wheel. <laughs> and you know, the, the, and we were, it was drilled into our brains that flyaways are a no-no and that we couldn't possibly hope to display any of our Barbie dolls with flyaway hairs. So that, that stylist spent days going through and over every single um, of our 200 plus dolls, making sure their hair was immaculate. And this particular slide shows the um, 1990s Barbie dolls. Um, it, and, and this is, um, you know, so this was a period in time in terms of fashion uh, where 1990s was looking back at Poochie and reinterpreting the original 60s 
Fuji into a 90 silhouette. And so you get these sort of body con micro mini things. Um, and so um, Barbie interpreted that. And behind it, you see there's a life-size dress. You just see the bottom of it. That also shows an example of that, that kind of dress from the 90s. But this, um, the two dolls on the left, those are called totally hair Barbie. And there's a Caucasian version and a black version of totally hair Barbie. This was the best selling Barbie doll, still is today of all time. And everyone knows it's the hair, the hair play, um, that Mattel calls it, hair play, which is super attractive to young people. So best that's selling amazing. Doll that's amazing. The doll that's the sort of middle, the third one from the left, that wave is just amazing. I mean, it is absolutely stunning. Um, I read a, an interesting um, uh, anecdote from the Barbie movie and the hair, they were, they were interviewing the hair designers. And the hair designers were talking about how to create the Barbie look on life-size people. And their rule of thumb was it, the hair had to be at least shoulder width. And I thought, oh my God, that's exactly true. That's exactly what makes Barbie's hair look like that. It is at least beyond the right. It at least goes here. Anything less than that looks like she's bald. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, this slide shows the doll's original 22 um, outfit sold from 1959. The original Barbie doll, you could buy 22 outfits. And we decided to display these first 22 in this shadow box form and really creating little pieces of art. Um, these first 22 were different than anything that followed. These were true little pieces of art, little magical zippers, um, real jewelry with little teeny, like, you, I can't imagine a toddler doing this, hooking little teeny hooks on necklaces, um, linings, the jackets had linings, um, little teeny accessories uh, that, um, you know, were so lovingly made that it's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a fascinating look at this, this first year. And um, a lot of these outfits had names that sort of um, dictated play patterns, like um, uh, Easter, Easter holiday or Roman holiday, you know, like going on a Roman holiday, there's a, there's a um, uh, Parisian, well, I forgot what it's called, Parisian, but they, but those were, those names were created to sort of give children a place to start in, in terms of their, their play patterns, which is an, an interesting sort of behind the scenes on the folks that were marketing uh, the, the, these outfits. Next, next uh, slide, please. Oh my God, that, you can continue on, because that, those look amazing, and they look like little, like, insect specimen things, like, pinned down. They're, it's really awesome. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly how we did it. It's on a, a board um, that's padded, and then it's, um, we covered the board with a stocking net, and then everything is just sewn in place, so it just stays there. Um, the, the most fascinating of those first 22 to me is this Roman holiday um, outfit, which comes with 15 separate pieces. And um, like you'll see the eyeglasses in the upper left corner, and just below the eyeglasses is an eyeglass case um, that came with this outfit. And then where the green arrow is pointing is a compact, a makeup compact that has a B embossed on it. The compact opens, you open the compact, and inside is a little powder puff. Now, Guess um, what happened to that compact? As soon as that package opened, that compact like disappeared into the pile carpeting, never to be seen again, right? So that compact is one of the most elusive of all accessories in the Barbie kingdom. And in fact, this compact is not even an original. This is a, a replica compact. And that 
the compacts are so elusive that an entirely ancillary market um, has started just creating replica compacts because you know the collectors want the complete sets but no it's just a handful of people left in the world that are able to have a complete roman holiday set because of this compact so this is a this is a replica compact but Again, these were supposedly outfits, toys designed for children, right? But I can't imagine, okay. I can't imagine a seven-year-old hooking the necklace on that or getting the hat with the veil in the right place or managing to save the eyeglass case to ever find it again after she opened up this package. So it's... <laughs> So this is um, another, so this is a good example of how you see the um, life size um, outfit paired with a Barbie outfit. Next slide, I think is a better look at the Barbie outfit. So there's the Barbie outfit that coincides with a moment in time when um, Jacqueline Kennedy makes a visit to India in her role as the first lady. And then we see Barbie a year, about a year later, in this Oleg Cassini dress that looks an awfully lot um, like Jacqueline's dress. And the fascinating thing I discovered only by accident is the, the, um, the, the catalog image that you see at the left is from the Sears catalog. And that makes that is that is, the Sears catalog calls that dress the bell dress. Mattel calls their orange dress the bell dress. Now I don't know which came first, but not only Sears, but the Barbie designers were inspired by Jacqueline's dress from Cassini all at the same time, which is absolutely a fascinating tidbit. This is a slide um, showing our space age moment in time with the Barbie looks, one of my favorite eras in Barbie. And we designed all sorts of, these are um, custom made stands. I didn't want the stands to be distracting at all. And so you don't, the typical Barbie stand now grabs onto the waist. And so we created stands, four different kinds of stands um, that are practically invisible. They go up, um, behind a pant leg or they go up behind a dress, but they are designed not to um, distort the um, fashion at all. Wow. And so we also included um, um, reference to the behind the scenes uh, creatives that are involved with um, creating this fashion for um, the Barbie dolls. and. Here, you know, is a sewing machine, and there's some other examples of the kinds of hairs and body types before they're painted, and um, it's a real look behind the scenes, which is kind of fascinating. So um, this is a look we have within our CSA membership um, a woman named Carol Spencer. Carol Spencer designed um, for the Barbie doll. She worked for Mattel um, from the mid sixties. And this is one of Carol's designs for Barbie. And Carol recently wrote a book called, um, dressing, dressing Barbie, which I highly recommend. It's a fantastic book she wrote. And Carol mentions in her book that this costume, this space age costume was inspired by Mugler's space age vixens from, from the period. And you really do see the pleating and, and the, the, the mutton sleeve, reference and you see where where that inspiration came from but the fascinating thing about this costume carol talks about how um this there, there's a lot of product um testing that goes on with real life little children and carol um presented um this look to the children and another space age look that was a little more authentic and um, looked more like real life um space um uniforms and the children were more, were, they were more attracted to this fantasy version of space than were the authentic um, space looks. And so that's how this space um, edition, this Barbie astronaut um, came to be as she tested better. So there are these Instagram moments within um, the, <laughs> within the exhibit that um, Illusion did such a good job of creating this life-size version of a um, ultra vet 
uh, which is you know a vehicle from from the period. Uh, so these these are fun um, photographic moments. Great, great photo yes. op. Yeah. And so then, because we were working with Mattel, um, the footprint of the exhibition grew a little bit uh, based on some of their personal um, corporate needs. And this is an example of their um, Dream Gap project. And this is a corporate civic engagement effort uh, dedicated to closing the gap by challenging gender stereotypes and helping undo the biases that hold girls back from reaching their full potential. So we referenced that in the exhibit. So um, this, so the exhibit is cool because it really does have its generational appeal, depends on whatever nostalgia you relate to. So if you grew up with Barbies in the 60s, there's something for you if you're a little girl this age, um, there's plenty for you to grab onto to in this exhibit. And um, the exhibit's next stop is the Phoenix Art Museum. And we're super excited that we'll open um, on Valentine's Day next year. Karen, the actual historic garments that you have in the in the exhibition as well, where did you get those from? Those are just collected um, from uh, vintage sites basically online. It was only because I had so much downtime sitting in front of the computer at home during the pandemic that I just literally looked at everything until I found something that was going to make sense. Not only yeah. this whole, the whole book of the exhibit only happened because I had so much time to waste. Uh, so, um, so as, 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 you know, most of us here know in exhibit, you only get to put in, in any exhibit, part of your research. And so I realized, you know, good, like, you know, in the early stages of pulling the exhibit together that in fact, I had uh, enough information. I really wanted to um, share that, that the book, um, the book got started. And this is um, an example. This is um, a carry case, a Barbie doll carry case. And in it, you see 1969, which is my most favorite era from Barbie fashion, 69. So um, this, so photographing the dolls was much more complicated than I ever expected. And um, the complication really had to do with how do you get the doll to stand up without showing the ugly stand. Um, and in this example, um, the paper, the photo paper is set on top of a very thick ethophone block. And hidden behind Barbie's leg is a metal spike rod. And that's attached to her invisibly that then sticks into the epiphone and she just sort of stands there for a short period of time while you're able to click. And, and then you have to go in and make sure she's right in and then get, get another one. So the, the secondary way to keep Barbies, for all of you who want to photograph Barbies going forward, the, the second way to keep Barbie looking like she's standing on her own is to suspend her with monofilament from under the arms. So that bar you see across is holding monofilament. And depending on the Barbie outfit, that really works well. And, you know, it just really depends on the outfit if you want to um, suspend her or spike her into the ground. Oh, wow. It's so faint. I can see the filaments, but yeah. Yeah, just barely. It really works great. Um, so, so we pitched this book project to um, a handful of publishers. Um, licensed and unlicensed options. And at this, this was before the Barbie movie came out. And I can't tell you how many rejections came back saying that Barbie was not relevant. Um, which is, I mean, literally two months later, it was all anyone was talking about. So we settled on um, going the official route. And this is a, an official um, book. Um, with Mattel, and we used um, Weldon Owen published this book, and they're a, a, a sanctioned publisher with Mattel. And you know, it was interesting working with Mattel. I was a little bit nervous about how they might curate um, what I wanted to say, but in fact, it was really fascinating to learn what pushed their buttons. And there's one, um, there was one kind of charming incident where. And I had labeled one um, one chapter title 
um, it was called Magic Mushrooms, and it was referencing psychedelic clothing of the era. And they rejected that um, because I guess it was, you know, there was, there was a drug tinge to it. And so that chapter became Psychedelic Mood instead. But it was, but it was perfectly fun to work with them. I learned a lot. So here's another example of um, Barbie um, is inspired by a Balenciaga look. Um, from the late 50s, and this is an outfit that's in the V&A's collection, and it's an awful good match. And this is this little, again, this is a, um, this, this little jacket has a lining in it, and it has little snaps underneath the buttons, and it's, it's quite chic, but it's hard to imagine that this appeals to an eight-year-old, right? But this is what was sold um, in the early 60s. So here is another example of a, um, a Barbie look that matched with a cultural look of the moment. This is a Patu look, and Barbie's, you know, has that same oversized center front bow knot, and the hood and it's barbie eyes but the silhouette is in fact i believe probably inspired by something that one of the mattel uh, designers were looking at for inspiration in the moment so this is case, amazing <clears throat> oh my god karen this has been fantastic really great and i love the comparison to the actual fashion uh, that you're that is inspiring it. This is really excellent. Okay, so we have a, several questions in the chat. So let me start with this. So Moya asks, do you know where the early Barbie clothing was made? Um, various places. I know a lot of Barbie clothing was made in Japan. Um, at certain, and, and, it, and there's an evolution to this. It changes over time. Um, but originally, I remember reading that um, they sourced, they felt like Japan was doing the best job of recreating and um, creating the amount of quality um, in these little teeny pieces. But I'm not a real expert on, on where it was made, but I do remember Japan was, in the early years, at least an important um, sourcing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then did Mattel outsource to another company the making of the clothing? Yes, everything. Yeah, Mattel isn't building clothing. Mattel is sourced out to um, the fashion industry. In fact, at some point in time, Mattel is like, the statistic is that they were making more fashion than any other single manufacturer of clothing in the United States. So yeah, they sourced, they weren't making their own fashion at all. They made little, um, you know, samples to make sure um, that it was going to work on the form and then to send a sample over to where it was going to be built. But no, they weren't manufacturing. Oh, cool. Um, so as a comment from Anne Watt, I was nine when I got my Barbie. I think they appealed to slightly older girls first. Um, I, I would guess that, um, and, but I think that even eight-year-olds, you know, you're, there's this aspirational aspect to Barbie, right? I mean, pretending like what you're going to be like when you grow up, what you're going to wear when you grow up. And I think that's where the psychological appeal of Barbie doll came in to teenage girls. Yeah. Um, Nightwing Whitehead said, I got my first for my second birthday, but my mother held on to it in the box until I was six, and I had no problems with the tiny fasteners. <laughs> oh, good for you. Good for you. Because I, when I was dressing some of these dolls, it was not easy. I mean, we had tweezers out to be able to hook these little teeny, I mean, they are little miniature little hooks and eyes. It's incredible. Maybe it's actually easier for little tiny hands of six-year-olds than it is for, oh, you know, hey. grown so, I mean, I have giant man paws that it would be like, uh, yeah, <laughs> it would just be terrible, like smashing things together. Um, uh, so Susan Boyd said, my aunt gave me a Barbie and I was really too young, but loved it. Uh, and I still have the clothes and the accessories. Good. 
good for you. I mean, you can't believe the collector's market. All of this stuff is incredibly valuable. There is still a huge market. People are still collecting. Um, it's super valuable. When we, there were some things missing from David's collection. So we were shopping on eBay every once in a while. I remember this, we needed a single shoe for one outfit. David only had one shoe that was supposed to go with this outfit. And we paid like almost $20 for a single Barbie shoe. It was shocking. <laughs> wow. Um, Anne Watts mentioned that Carol Spencer was, uh, she thought was a CSA member, and in fact she was, so huzzah, thank you Carol Spencer. Um, another viewer has asked, what are the future stops for the tour after Phoenix? Um, um, it's heading to the East Coast after Phoenix, it's in Phoenix through July, and then I believe the following 2024 fall, it will be on the East Coast. And then um, tentatively, we head to the Midwest. And then that's as far as we know now. It may go um, to another country after after this. Fantastic. Um, oh, wow, there are lots more things popping up, which is great. Um, Christine Esquivin suggests the documentary Black Barbie about the Black employees over the many years we're able to get uh, Black Barbie is produced at Mattel, a roller coaster effect. I was, uh, it was screened here at the Colorado Island, uh, Coronado Island Film Festival. Yes, I've heard of that and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And of course, you know, the very first Black Barbie that Mattel introduces is not until 1980. And the first Black Barbie is designed by a Black um, fashion designer working at Mattel, Kitty Perkins. And um, that her legacy, her legacy is like cemented in that first beautiful black Barbie doll. Fantastic. Okay, I think this will be. There are other comments that, um, but I'm going to pick up the last two questions. Um, have the plastics in the collection started to misbehave? I be, I e become sticky or oozy or discoloration. Yeah, it's really fascinating. There are all sorts of plastics in the Barbie doll. The hair, of course, is plastic. And in the very early black skinned Barbie dolls, the black colored hair over time turns bright orange. And oh. it's just an oxidation process. And all and if you and now when you'll see these dolls come up for auction, like Julia, um, the doll Julia um, now has her hair is, is bright orange. They started all black, but over time. So yes, in fact. Um, these plastics are just doing what plastics do, and based on when the doll was made will define how the formulation ages. And the other interesting thing is that there are different formulations of plastics in different parts of the body, so the head and the arms and the torso could be different formulations, and so they age differently. Excellent. Um, and then the last question, and there are other comments, and Karen's book is in the chat for everyone, so go purchase the book. Um, <clears throat> do you think that there will be a Mattel Barbie Museum, or is there an official archive with Mattel, or is it solely a private collection? Um, our exhibit features David Porcello's private collection. And in fact, Mattel doesn't really have an extensive um, fashion archive. There are some um, manuscript collections within their archive, not super extensive. Um, but if you were, as, for instance, there are a few private collectors that have put their Barbie collections on public display. I think there's one in Canada, you know, and they just put all their Barbies out, um, but it's not officially sanctioned from Mattel, but it's just one person's private collection. Um, so, like Mattel wouldn't, Mattel wasn't able to create an exhibit like this. They don't have the, you know, they just don't have, they don't have an archival collection like this, like David, like David has. Oh, wow. Karen, thank you so much. So lovely. This has been a wonderful romp through Barbie fashion, and it's great to see you, Karen. Um, and thank you all for joining this afternoon as we went through this wonderful icon of the catwalk. Thank you all very much.